Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to my uh, video for today regarding Amazon RDS. We're going to do a walkthrough on deploying uh, a MySQL instance on Amazon RDS. RDS stands for um, Amazon Relational Database, Amazon Relational Database Service. And we say it's a web service that makes it easier to set up, operate, and scale a relational database in the cloud. And of course, what better place to get that definition than from Amazon themselves? Now, so we're going to go to Amazon RDS on AWS. We're going to log in and deploy an instance and walk through the several little bits of things you need to be aware of when doing that deployment. Before I do that, I'd just like to point out a few things. Why should we resort to this um, method of managing a database? You will agree with me that in these days of convergence, DevOps, and things, you may not always need a dedicated database administrator who has all the details of how to manage the database, needs to know about underlying files and all that, is to be able to set up HADR. When you deploy your database on RDS, it's so much easier to get it working once and for all. It's so much easier to um, um, you know, configure, uh, have availability and a DR sites with, with the, the availability zones that Amazon provides. It's so much easier to scale, take backups, upgrades, and of course, you, in most parts of the world, for most, most organizations, you, I can tell you that Amazon will do a better job of securing your environment than you can do. Uh, while I say that there is a caveat, you realize that when you're engaging cloud services providers, there is a border between the responsibility of the cloud service provider and your responsibility in terms of managing security. That said, um, to a large extent, a lot of the aspects of managing a database are very made much, much easier if you deploy on RDS. So let's go over to our, um, our console, our AWS management console. When you uh, log in, this is typically the landing page that you will see. And because I've visited some of the modules already, uh, some of the services already, they are here in my recently visited services page. If that's not the case with you, you have to go up here, services, and then select the service you want. You can look for it in this long list or simply type RDS and go to relational management, manage uh, database service. All right, so uh, I already have, uh, um, I already have a database instance deployed, but we're going to walk through one deployment, and then I'm going to point out a few things, things I learned along the way, as well as things that are available in AWS documentation. Now, I will, I can easily start from here, or I can check, first of all, what instances I have already deployed, and determine I, I can manage my instances from here. But we're, we're just going to create a new database instance. I don't need this right now. And I have to decide what kind of instance I want to create. Now, Amazon keeps advertising Aurora. Aurora is their um, um, variation of MySQL. And it's advertised as a more robust, a faster database based on testing. I've not tested it myself, but I'm sure I believe them. But today, we're just going to focus on MySQL. One of the reasons for that is you will find that it is a little less expensive than Aurora. You have the opportunity of uh, deploying other kinds of databases on Aurora, on, on Amazon RDS, namely, I mentioned Aurora, MySQL, MariaDB, SQL Server, Oracle, and Postgres. Today, we're just going to focus on MySQL, the community version, and we'll determine what version do we want to deploy. I most often like to deploy the latest version. This is the version that is now owned by um, uh, Oracle, basically. So this is what I want to do. Now, I decide what template do I want to do? I want to do production, dev test, and all that. I can, for the purpose of this demo, select the free tier option. 
I select the free tier option and I decide what will be my instance identifier. Let me call it um, um, eat fast or whatever. I mean, it's for an application called eat fast or eat, uh, eat food delivery service. Now I decide what do I want to be my master um, user. I can call it eat master user. It's always um, important to select credentials that you can easily relate to what you are using those credentials for. I'm just going to do it a simple password. I'm not going to tell you what the password is. Simple password for my master in database. Then I select the instance size. I select the instance size. And um, here I'll just, because I've selected free tier already, it's, I've been given a T2 micro with one CPU and one gig of RAM. And all that, all those selections are, are, are made to align with the fact that I have chosen not to pay for this instance. Now, every other setting, you typically would have it as default. And here, this is an interesting area, availability and durability. You can decide whether you want to deploy in a multi-availability zone deployment. That's what that means is that you want replicas of your database in other availability zone for the purpose of DR. Because I selected free tier, I don't have that available. But in your production environment, you may want to have that available. But it all depends on the kind of application you're deploying. If you're doing an application that is uh, your, your recovery time objective, uh, and, and your recovery point objective allow you f some level of lag or flexibility, maybe it's one day, what you can typically do is to rely on the snapshots because the snapshot you can configure for daily or hourly and you use that as your recovery strategy. That way you save money. So it's a balance between saving money and um, having the best um, availability setup. So that's for the multi ed deployment. Now, connectivity or networking, in this case, I decide, do I want, which VPC do I want to deploy this? In Amazon AWS, when you say virtual private cloud, you're uh, uh, typically just saying the, my data center in the cloud. My, your VP, VPC defines the area that you have chosen to deploy resources, and that is equivalent to uh, having a server room or a data center on premise. So your VPC is basically your data center in the cloud. I have created one already here, which I have specific settings, which I have um, defined. So I'm going to use that. And I have additional um, configuration options for my connectivity. This is very important. And I will also highlight it more in the gotchas of this presentation. Now I have a number of subnet groups, which determine how my instance will be de deployed, uh, how my instance will be accessible to me. I have a subnet group that is, uh, a database subnet group that is private. I have that which is public. I'm going to select the public. I'm going to show you in detail later on what, these, what this actually means. And then I'm going to decide, is my instance going to be publicly accessible? Because I want to demonstrate to you the accessibility from my uh, uh, workbench, which is on my desktop i'm going to select that option yes i want it to be available and then the security group where i will deploy this rds instance that's my uh, my my security group is like my fire something that defines my firewall who defines who is going to uh, um, hit be able to uh, um, um, hit my instance and, and and from wherever i decide in, you know in a firewall typically what you're saying is you're creating rules that determine source, target, and port numbers. Now, I have already done that with the security groups that I have, and I'm going to show you the definitions of the security groups as well. All right, so I'm selecting database servers as my security group for this deployment. So once you select it, you see this displayed there. I can decide that I want my instance in the availability groups that are available to these uh, VPC, 
2E, 2C, or just say, okay, anyone you like. And in the AWS engine will deploy the database instance to any of the availability zones that are, that are present in my configuration. All right, so this is authentication options. Do you want to use uh, identity access management or do you just want to use simple password to access the instance? I'll just select simple password. All right, more settings here. Now, I, can, I, I want to decide, you remember what I have selected are uh, the details for my instance. Now I'm going to select some details for my database itself. So I initially selected the options that had to do with the instance itself. I'm now going to deploy the select options that have to do with a database which will be deployed inside the instance. If you're familiar with the structure of MySQL, you remember that it's an one instance, many databases architecture. So I just call my first database each db okay and all, all other things remain the same enable automatic backups and i decide backup retention backup window no preference i can select a window if i want uh let's say it starts at, at 1 a.m utc and duration for three hours Okay, I can decide to enable this different log reports. I will just use the error report. And then finally, those are the key things. And I say, okay, go ahead, create database. At each point during the process, the status of my database creation is shown here, it will take a bit of time, so I'll use that time to show you a little more about the networking options that I choose. Now, subnet groups. I have four different subnet groups here, and each of them have certain definitions. The first one is the database subnet group. I'll show you the definition of that. This subnet group um, has three subnets in the three availability zones. And the CIDR blocks the classless interdomain routing blocks, if you know a bit of networking, are uh, three. One, th these, are, these are slash 24 um, IP addresses. That means that the first three octets define the network and the last octet defines the host 24 bits the entire four octets is a total of 32 bits yes <clears throat> so when you say 24 that means the first 24 bits define the hosts uh, the network rather while the last defines the last octet defines the um identifies the host. So in this case, we have three networks, one, two, and three. And all three are part of these subnet group. Now, when you have a subnet that is not, doesn't have access to the public internet as part of a subnet group, it is typically understood that that subnet group is a private subnet group that means you don't expect anything sitting uh, dependent on that subnet group to have access externally so these three subnets are are actually private subnets i'll go back to the networking area and show you in detail what i mean by private subnets let's go back to the subnet groups and then we have another one which is the public database subnet group this data this subnet group has another three different CIDR blocks, 0, 3, and 4. Remember I said the first three octets refer to the network, uh, and the last octet refers to the host. So I have also three subnets here, but in this case, these subnets are actually public subnets. I will show you how that is defined in the networking section. 
So these are subnet groups. So you remember that when I chose my options, I chose the database subnet group public because I want this instance to be available on the public internet. So let's go over to um, EC2. And first of all, since we've started talking about subnets, I will show you the subnets that I have configured here. Now, where are you? Network and security placement group network interfaces. Okay, I have security groups here. So let's go to VPC. Sorry, my internet is a bit slow. I live in Africa. All right, so on the VPC, I have my subnets. VPC, remember the VPC is your virtual private cloud, which essentially is the definition of your um, data center in the cloud. All right, so I have uh, one, two, three, four, five subnets here. The first subnet, my backend subnet, I'll show you. Let's modify this a bit. I'll show you how it's defined. So my subnet has a routing table that says that this is the destination. Uh, yes, access control list determine how traffic happens with this subnet. All traffic allowed, all traffic allowed out. That's what's happening here. Uh, let's look at that um, table. So that'd be fine. My public subnet, on the other hand, has what you call an internet gateway defined in the routing table. An internet gateway allows you, allows this public subnet to have access to the internet. The same thing with the second public subnet also has this um, routing table associated with it. Then the third is also a public subnet and has this routing table associated with it. All private subnets do not have the internet gateway associated, uh, defined in their routing table. That means they have no route to the external internet. So if I want my data, my database subnet group must have the subnets that are defined as public subnets. That means the subnets that have an internet gateway associated with them. So that's what basically you've done. That's in terms of subnets, subnet groups, and then the database subnet groups that I've created. Now let's go up to something else. Uh, network access control list, typically, um, I have also done something here where I've defined rules that say if you, uh, that you allow traffic within this subnet, all traffic within this subnet. And then I have another control list that determines, inbound rules, determines uh, the same, the similar uh, routing, uh, routing rules. Now, in each of these cases, you have what you call the subnet association that determine which subnets are going to follow these rules. In the case of in the case of my VPC, which I have already defined, I mentioned earlier, I have five subnets that all uh, you know follow these rules that I have defined here. I want to warn you that this is not perfectly defined. A network person would define it in more detail or if you're working with um, a, a real a production environment you want to be more um, granular in your definitions for the sake of security now see the subnets that are associated with this network access control list so i've talked about subnets i've talked about access control list and then i'm going to talk about security groups remember when i was configuring my database I configured it with this security group, which is my uh, database server security group. The definition of these database server security group is that 
allow everything that is coming from everywhere to talk to this um, this environment and on port 3306. Also, there's another rule that says allow this um, security group, this other security group, to talk to me on port 3306. 3306 is the default port for my SQL uh, database instances. So this, they are, so there, you see that there are three aspects of networking, three or four aspects of networking that you have to pay attention to when configuring the, our database instances on RBS. Number one, subnets and subnet groups. Number two, network access control lists, which are associated with these subnets. And then number three, security groups. So let's go back and see whether our instance is ready. All right, we'll go back and check up which of the instances are live. All right, so I have two instances out of 40 is my limit. And then um, finally, all right, so my instance is now available. It is now available. So what's going to happen is that I'm going to, uh, I, I just noticed this update uh, information. This is also important if you want to make sure your instance is using the latest TLS version, you should do this upgrade. So let's once let's just take a look at the inst the options we have taken. Remember, I have gone through the um, networking options with you. We we'll just look through all the options we defined. This is what you call the endpoint. The endpoint is important. It's like the excuse me. It's like the server name as a means to connect to the instance. Let's just try that out. This is the syntax, my SQL, then I specify the host, port number, username, and let's try that out in one of our, sorry about that. So let's try that out in one of our um, instances, our party environment. So because this, uh, this server is, remember, we had two security groups, two key security groups for our RDS instance. We had one that allowed everybody to come in on port 3306. We had another one that allowed another security group to come in on port 3306. This server that I'm in is in that security group that is allowed. So that's why from a networking point of view, it's, so I put in my password and I'm in. So I do show databases. And this is the database that I created as part of the creation of this instance, it's DB. So I'm able to connect, the database is available. Now we're gonna do something interesting. We're gonna also try this from our workbench instance. So let's look for workbench and try a connection here. A connection, I'm sorry, just call it any name we want. This is it EB connection. Then in this case, we're not gonna use the full um, string. We're just gonna need, all, all we need is the, the host name. So this, this is what we need here. Of course, it's actually the full string, but not specified in that way. This is a GUI, so we need the we we, we provide the full the host name here. In, in place of the actual host name, we provide the endpoint name. The port number is provided. The username is it master user, and then we provide a password. We can either provide the password straight, or we wait for the prompt. So let's try it out. Test connection. When we do that, in this particular case, it spends a long time. Once you're doing that, you know that the connection is not going through. You have a network problem. Now, I'm going to fix this network problem 
and then I'm going to come back to and explain why the network problem is having. But let's is happening. But first of all, let's get the error message. So it takes a while because it has to go through the timeout period. Uh, it has to, uh, the timeout has to be elapsed, and then it finally returns the error that is uh, that that is a problem here. So um, wait for it. I'm going to try that again. I expect to get the error. Okay, let's let's just complete the connection and try the connection. We should get the error here. All right, so this is the error we get. Uh, essentially, it says this is a connection error, this, this reason, whatever it is. I mean, a lot of uh, stuff around the security. Now, when I escalated this to AWS, one of the um, diagnoses they gave me was that there may be something wrong with my client. Because as you can see, we've tested and we've seen that the database is available. We've seen that our configurations are correct. We've done all the networking configurations correctly, but we're still getting this. Now, one of the tests I did was to use another internet service provider to attempt this connection. So I'm going to just change my internet service provider. Um, let's do that here. I'm going to just switch and pick softline off, and connect here. Okay, so once I'm connected here, I'm going to try it again. Once I try it, let's see. Good, so I'm getting the password prompt now. So you can see that your problem can come from a, di a, a variety of sources, but the truth is, once you see you are not able to establish a connection in reasonable time from outside, the instance most likely the problem you have is a network problem or security okay once we're connected we can see we'll be able to um see our dashboard our databases and on and on schemas yeah sorry we can see the eat db which we created and so on so we've been able to establish a connection successfully using a different uh, using a different internet connection than the one we originally started with okay so let's uh, switch back to our connection because it's better in terms of quality so you may want to when troubleshooting such complex issues you may want to talk to your internet service provider on the details now, let's look at a few other things that we need to be aware of before we round up this session. All right, oh, sorry. All right, so, key gotchas. We have talked about the networking configuration, looking at the security groups, the net subnet groups, and of course, the network access control lists. We have also talked about endpoints versus, versus hostname, which means when you are connecting to a MySQL instance on Amazon RDS, you should be using the endpoint, which represents your hostname. Now, finally, the point which I uh, you know, highlighted in this slide is start small, think big. If you are a startup or you are just experimenting, recall that I used the free tier option with a T2 micro, the smallest possible server type, to deploy this instance. You may want to do that because you want to start small and then control your costs and be able to grow gradually by because it's easy to scale up in, in AWS. It's easy to uh, even scale out if you want. But the point is start with a small instance and then gradually 
grow it. So let's go and see a little bit about the cost on AWS dashboard itself. Sorry about that. Um, where are you? Okay. okay sorry about that. Let's go back. Yeah. Okay, so our console, our console, we can go in here and we'll be able to see our billing dashboard. We can tell how much is Amazon RDS actually costing us. So this is an interesting um, thing to look at. You can see if you decide to use Amazon, typically you will not be spending a lot if you manage your resources properly. And if you go to, if we go to the breakdown, let's go to the breakdown for last month for us. We have this December now, let's go to November. Uh, November, okay, nothing much. Uh, yes, October. Out of $53, if you go to um, Relational Management Database Service, we find out that we are not spending any significant amount of money here typically because we have been using, uh, we are really, really running on free tier. We are not spending anything at all. For 700 hours plus, we spend nothing. So we see, compare the, that with the um, Linux T2 micro instance per hour, uh, and sorry, the on-demand instance per hour we did, and we're spending $24 in a month. So. Roughly, you can see that if you manage your deployments properly, you will not be spending much on Amazon at all. And if you grow your business to the, you can grow your, you can work hard and grow your business over a period of one year, and then decide to scale up your instances to meet more demand. So let's go back to the RDS and see final, you know, have a final view of any other thing I may want to point out before we close this session. All right, um, yes, go back, final, final view of this. Yeah, so we are looking at our settings, security group, we're using the um, DW service security group and the settings, and we're using the um the, the the subnet group the public subnet group monitoring are we using any monitoring the logs where we have we have we have an error log here you can actually view your error log straight here if you in, in aws rds and more details of the configuration i'm using a t2 micro and so on and so forth and finally our backups are being taken if you want you can initiate the backup right away okay thank you very much these are actions you can also take reboot and uh, if, if you want to modify this you can do that and some modification options require a reboot of the instance and you can always do that so we're going to stop here for now and probably another session if you want if you want another session please ask a question in the comments Ask question of what you want to know, what you want us to dive into deeper, what you want to clarify, any issues you're having, put it in the comments se section, and we'll get some of our experts to answer you. Thank you very much for spending time with us today. We've been talking about Amazon RDS, specifically my SQL community version. Thank you very much. Subscribe, share, comment. Yeah.